All right, good morning, everyone. So welcome to day four of the Apricot Tutorials. Um, just before we get, begin with Barry's um, fourth day um, in front of the mic and the camera, uh, just to let you all know that, um, well, as ever, these tutorials are being recorded and will go on the website really as soon as we can. Uh, we have the tutorials recordings for the first two days on the website now, and the third day should appear soon. Um, we'd also like to thank Internet Society for being our training partner this week. We really value the support and um, really appreciate well, the long-term support the Internet Society has provided for Apricot. So thank you very much for that. Uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, please ask them in the chat. Um, or you can click the reactions button and wave your hand and we'll notice that as well. Um, you don't need to interrupt Barry if you think of questions, and as he said, questions from the whole uh, tutorial the whole week, um, please put them in the chat and we'll find an opportunity to answer the questions. Please don't be shy. Um, there's a lot of serious things going on these days in the internet, especially recently, so if you have any questions or any doubts, you've got the experts sitting there right in front of you, so please ask away. Otherwise, um, hope you enjoy the day, and over to you, Barry. Thank you. And so why, while I'll share my screen, um, uh, you know, again, thanks to the Internet Society, because uh, the Internet Society has been a cornerstone for empowering the community since its inception. Uh, my first introduction to the Internet Society was um, the first uh, Director Tony Rakowski was my wife's old boss. And uh, she says, you need to know about the Internet Society. So introduce me to Tony and then in walks Vince Cerf. It was the first time I met Vince Cerf. I'm kind of floored, you know, going on what's what's happening. So anyways, that's a, a bit about that. Um, for those of you who haven't been with us the last few days, um, the original intent of this, what we're doing this week is a basically a resuscitation or a reinvestment into the materials that we've developed over the years for training organizations to build DDoS uh, resiliency architectures into their organization. So that way they can withstand a DDoS and not have it uh, impact their business as bad as it could be. Uh, but then, geopolitical things happened in the world. So we started adjusting based off of actually looking at real time data feeds. And in the second session today, we'd be talking about trust groups and what is going on behind the scenes in different security communities and how you can uh, uh, work your way into those and tap into the knowledge of those. Um, and and you know, so we would watch this and I would make adjustments. So like today, if you notice, Session 4.1, which was supposed to be a side module, I pulled up because it's really important because we're seeing uh, router break-ins as we speak. Um, and then the second session today is building trust groups. Is it's actually session three. So we reordered things around. So that way, if something happens, we're trying to get information in your hands as, as soon as possible. So that's why we've made the adjustments around it. Um, if you run into a crisis, like if all of a sudden you get caught in a crossfire or you get targeted um, because organizations are gonna, uh, right now the hypothesis is that um, because different countries are doing sanctions um, uh, in various roles and different requirements that you're gonna get uh, retaliation attacks. That's the, the, um, the threat vector right now. That's what people think that's gonna happen. Uh, whether it happens or not, we don't know. Right, so if it happens, don't panic. Trust your team, no matter where you are in your security posture for DDoS resiliency or ransomware resiliency. Um, what we find over the years is the best thing to do is trust your team, invest in the team, encourage them to collaborate with their peers. Um, there, there's a community out there that can help out. If you run into, uh, get stuck with something, you can reach out to people like me. I'm now part of your network. Um, so please connect up to me and you can find out with that. I, you know, um, I honor the time when somebody calls me up and say, help, 
we need to plug in and I find the right people, plug them in, and then they go and take care of business. It's always a, a you know, a, kind of like an honor for me to be able to have that sort of service to, to organizations. So, um, so that's quick guidance. If somebody asked me today, you're right, hey, I need to like, you know, get ready. Like, I'm really worried about what's happening out there. Um, I would basically do this, get approval from the bosses, clear the path for time, um, and then create basically multiple swim lanes of action, right? So multiple streams of action. I have one team focusing on my DDoS risk, one team focusing on my ransomware risk, one team going out there and patching like crazy, patch, 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 find every single version of whatever needs to be patched and get it upgraded because we're always behind the scenes on upgrade, right? Then I would, um, anybody who touches my customers, I would set up the communication script, the salespeople, the marketing people, the customer support people, all those are our touch points. So that way, if some customer calls up and we're under attack or we have a ransomware or something's going on, then we can keep our customers calm, right? So that way we don't have egg on our face. Uh, that also includes uh, investor relations if you're a publicly traded company, right? Then you have media communications team, the PR. Now notice the PR is last. Sometimes what happens in companies, people to put the PR first. No, PR is last. Because the PR uses all the work that comes from all the four other teams, the swim lanes, and they use that as part of the press communication, right? And then throughout, you make sure each team has a team lead and a team scribe, so you can document how things go. So, so this is kind of like last week, a crisis of this magnitude, just give an example at Akamai, we didn't have a crisis of this magnitude before. And this is essentially what uh, early last week, what we spun up it was part of the effort of spinning up it. And now we got teams working on each of these areas in this way, right? So here's an example of a large company. And this is kind of like, we got different swim lanes of activities. And in the swim lanes of activities, we have like team leads and scribes, you know, the scribes for us is actually simple stuff, but everybody's dumping things into like uh, Google Docs or, Right, because we use Google Docs a lot. So we dump things into there and we, we scribe it into that. So, so there's uh, something, if your bosses say, I, we need to do something right now, you can follow this if you don't have a, a, a playbook. Um, all the materials right now um, for this is being posted up on uh, Apricot site, and then it will be mirrored over onto here with the additions, because this is just the start of a process that will take probably over a year as we update all the different materials. Um, one of my colleagues, Demi mentor over Google, we were comparing notes and looking at other things we need to include in the curriculum based on our, our activities and things that we're doing. So this is a way that you can follow along or you can connect to me on LinkedIn and things like that and you can follow along. Um, the first day we did like a, a insert session, Shields Up, which we used a, um, how do we start reading these advisories, these Intel advisories coming out a lot of people ignore these advisories and it's to your detriment. And we'll see today in this first session as an example of that. And then uh, understanding the DDoS miscreants, why they attack and how they attack and really focus on that behavior, right? Get, get away from, as I said in the past, the, uh, the, the, the bits and the bytes and the volume and focus on what the miscreant is doing, their actions and things like that. Um, that's, that's one of the key things with it. Then we did a session on how to respond to DOS attacks and then a session on source, source address validation, the re hard reality of the source address validation. It's not as, it's not as, the early days it was easy to get like 80% of the internet covered. Now we're in the 20% and the 20% is hard and it takes everybody's effort to kind of keep on pushing, pushing, pushing to, to take care of that, that last part. Um, and it's an ongoing effort because the 20% in the internet keep on growing. All right, so it doesn't go, uh, you know, doesn't stop. Then on day three, we focused on runbook and playbook, and we did a session on the authoritative DNS and the DNS system, because what we see a lot of name server attacks, um, small level attack, not a volumetric attack, small level attack, hits a name server in Ukraine, knocks out the name server, goes down because of an overload, box reboots, um, the attack stops. So the attack lasts like two, three, four minutes, box crashes, the attack, attacker comes back 15, 20 minutes later, hits it again, crashes. So it's not one of these, like I launch an attack and just keeps on going. It's somebody's watching the system, whacks it down, steps back, has a T, comes back up, whacks it again, right? So 
this this is what we want to uh, avoid. We want to get our authoritative DNS systems working to withstand these sort of things, and it's actually quite easy to do. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on the protecting routers and switches. It's actually a huge um, module, but we're only going to cover the first part and some parts I put in there on. Uh, what is the impar impar imperative threat? So you'll see as we go through that. And then how do you plug into this security community? How do you, how do you tap into um, what I do and others do? So I'm gonna kind of like open up my playbook of what I do, me, as a security person who like lives this day in, day out, um, and um, how I keep abreast of things, right? Of what I do. So I'm gonna give you a sample of the sort of things that I do. Um, and then you can tap into that and follow that along, all right? So that's what we're gonna be doing today. So I'm gonna go over to our first session. And remember, if you have any questions, just pop them in. And right before I go to the next session, I'm going to go over here really quick. And for the new people who are come on who haven't seen the slides yet in the chat, I'll just drop them into the chat again. So sorry if it's a duplicative effort. And let's see, we want this one right here. Okay, so um, this is going to be another example, right? I'll just flip through this. Another example of, of um, you know, uh, what's happening with, um, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of like a little bit shocked. I'm a little bit shocked because I think as I mentioned in the earlier session, we were looking at spoofed addresses and I was explaining people about using the spoofer data. And then I noticed a data point they had in one of the recent studies where they showed that most of the organizations that they're measuring with the spoofer data, this is from CADA, um, are, not, <laughs> are not filtering um, their own address blocks, spoofing into their own organization. And I went like, holy cow, um, you know, this is like a red alert. The red alert is, you know, we got organizations and some of you are probably those organizations who are not protecting the router switches and network devices. And the risk has resulted that the 5i security agencies, I mentioned this before, 5i is, is a national intelligence security agreement between Canada, United Kingdom, United States, Australia, and New Zealand. There's five, five eyes. They, they exchange super top secret information with each other all the time. And they exchange super top secret cybersecurity information all the time. So when you see two or three of them pop up and do a security alert, it's not only that, it's not just one eye sees it, it's like multiple eyes sees it and they go like, holy cow, this is serious. So you wanna pay attention to them. Yes, they're hard to read, and we're going to walk through this with this particular thing right now because of the, the risk vectors going on with, with uh, breaking into routers, right? So targeted network devices. Let's take one of the things from several years ago. And I was reading through this, and I wasn't paying attention because I'm not, I don't touch routers right now. I got other people in you know, the organization I'm in right now who takes care of the network. I'm doing other product creation stuff. So I wasn't really paying attention to it. And I should have paid attention to this. I sh I'm, I'm going to take extra note of this because what this said is, <laughs> look at this. And this is topical right now. Russian state-sponsored cyber actors are targeting network infrastructure. They're going after devices that do GRE. They were using Cisco-specific things. They were going in via SNMP, right? OK, wake up, right? They were using it to redirect. DNS information, they're using it for all sorts of range of different activities. So this, this is an advisory that came out, joint advisory in 2018. 2018, right? Now, to keep in mind that 2018, we're going to get to the end of this as we walk through it. Now, what are they saying? And this is the thing to wake up with it, right? That you had a trusted security partner. In other words, it wasn't a government. It was a trusted security partner. So in other words, somebody in private industry or multiple people in private industry, they won't say whether it's one or multiple, right? Reported, here's what's going on. So in other words, what happens, and you'll find this out in the next session, that the trust groups, we as private industry, we have a lot of data. We can see a lot of things going on and we collaborate with each other. In other words, even though we compete, we also collaborate. 
So we collaborate with each other and we find problems and we collect data. And a lot of times we get them in front of like, we can't do, we, sometimes we can do something about it as private industry, but sometimes what we need to do is we need to report it to public. This is the public private partnership. So we report it to like governments um, and police and things like that. And so here is a reported into DHS, United States, FBI, and uh, UK NCSC, right? So that says something here. So this, this is a private entity that actually crosses, you know, US and UK. They went out there and then validated it. So they did, they did, they just don't take something from private industry and say, oh, they have to, as part of their job, working for the government, working for the civic society, validate it. So they go and validate it. And they validate it and say, yes, this is a worldwide cyber exploitation. In other words, wherever you are in Asia, this was impacting you. This is state-sponsored cyber actors going after your network. They targeted governments, they targeted private sector, they targeted critical infrastructure, they targeted ISPs. So if you're a government, private sector, critical infrastructure or ISP, you were targeted by Russian state actors to get into your routers and your switches and other network devices inside your network. The FBI has high confidence that the Russian state actors were using the routers. In other words, this is the active, man in the middle to support espionage. In other words, they were spying on things, extracting intellectual property, maintain persistence in your network. In other words, they're trying to set things up where they can't get kicked off, advanced persistent threat, right? And then lay the foundation for future operations. That is a wake up call. Future operations, like if there was a cyber war someday, I'm being quiet for a minute, so everybody let that sink in. 2018, Russian state actors, get into the network to potentially lay the foundation for future offensive operations in case there was a cyber war. So what have you done since 2018? <laughs> I asked this to my, my team yet today. It says, what have you guys, what, what have we been doing? Oh, we did, you know, at least, you know, in, inside Akamai, the network team, we're all paying attention and we've done things. So here the report continues on. You know, right? The cyber actors use these weaknesses right, to get into the network. They identify vulnerable devices, extract device configurations, map network infrastructure, harvest login credentials. So they use it to go in there and because there's all lots of unencrypted traffic inside your network and lot, harvest stuff, masquerade, modify, right? They're doing all this sort of thing, right? And, and once they're in, they can do all sorts of things with, you know, disrupt activities with it, right? It's it's scary what you can do if you get, get inside you know routers and switches and you have free reign and you can laterally move across the routers and switches. So what do we do right now? Right? If you're if you're if if you are not waking up and being scared, says what do I do right now? What if the Russians are in my network right now and they wake up? Right? And this is being very explicit because it says Russian state actors, right? Because it says Russian cyber actors, right? We're in the middle of a there's a cyber conflict in the globe going on, right? So here's where you're lucky. I've mentioned this before, Cider, Cider, uh, shadowserver.org, right? You sign up for the daily reports because with the daily reports, one of the things you can do because they are scanning the network, they're doing what the Russians are doing to scout out your network. That's what Shadow Server is, is doing. They're, they're scanning things out and they're giving just you the report, right? And how bad is it? So one of the scans they do is they scan for open access SSH. And I look, I pulled this data down from, from it today. I'm going like, holy cow, look at, this is off to the side here. This is millions, millions of devices, millions of devices around the world who are, have open SSH ports. In other words, you know, and probably most of those SSH ports are not being um, you know, protected from like brute force break-ins. That sort of thing, right? You know, or or other sort of nonsense, right? This is, you know, that's a lot of risk exposed to the internet. Then you look, how bad is it? It's really bad. Look at all the telnet, <laughs> millions again of telnet open access, right? And look at the solid red, right? United States sitting right there, big solid red, right? Australia is a little bit pinkish. But it's still, there's a lot out there. 
Now you can go down to here and Shadow Server will break down the statistics by country and things like that. So you can see it. You get the specifics to, on your network, right? Because what you'll get is you'll get this report. It's like one report is the accessible SSH report, the accessible tenant report, the device identification report. There's also a SNMP report because they, they mentioned in this that they're using simple network management protocol. And if it's exposed to the internet, so right here, right here, you just take these reports and you look at your network and you go like, these routers need to be checked. These devices need to be checked, right? So, so there, now how much does it cost you? Zero, there's no charge to this. This is a public benefit service that you sign up for and you can start finding out what has the Russians been seeing and how can I go out there and let's, let's plug up the Telnet, let's plug up the SSH, right? Any of those devices that have, were exposed, I got to do a password rotation on, right? Let's assume that they know my passwords. Let's do a password rotation on. That sort of stuff with it, right? So, so there's a link to these. So here's like the big four. I was looking through this today as I was crafting it up and the big four on here, the SSH, the Telnet, device identification goes across your network. So, so Shadow Server is building up a huge library of devices. So you can say, here's the different IoT devices, these are different types of Linux servers, and these are temperature monitors, you know, a whole range of different things out there. And then an accessible, uh, simple network man management protocol, right? Um, so those, those are all out there. So, so then when you look at this and you continue, this is out of the report. This is a cut and paste from the report. That's why these reports coming from the five eyes are actually really, really valuable to understand how do I trigger my playbook? In other words, I have a DDoS play resiliency playbook, right? Incident playbook. I have a ransomware one. And one of the things to do to make sure the refresh is when these reports come out, you open the playbook up and says, let's look through this, right? And so what they're pointing out is that here's the risk. The risk is if you can own the router, you can modify and deny traffic to the organization, right? You can set up key hosts inside an organization. You can set up you know, little bastions off to the side, right? Um, the, the point in here with the SCADA, right? You know, going into like critical infrastructure systems, right? Whoever controls route and infrastructure of a network essentially controls the data flowing through the network. So given the risk, why do organizations neglect their network device security? That's the, the shocker to me. Why, why is this happening with it? Now, how long ago was this taught? Um, yesterday, you heard Phil Smith and I joke along that in Apricot 1, <laughs> all the way back in 96, we were teaching how do you lock down and protect. It was actually called, the session was called um, going into the side door. We call going into routers the side door into a network. So you had your front door, you had your back door, and then the side door was the router. That's what we, that, that was a session that was referring to at the time as a side door with it. So this is uh, something that is a long-term threat vector in there. The other thing this report went on to here is it says uh, the devices are often easy targets because some of the devices, you know, especially on the residential routers, they don't run anything, right? It's, it's like we see this all the time, and I mentioned this about uh, miscreants uh, breaking into the CPE routers inside of an ISP, and the ISPs never replace the CPEs because you have to do a truck roll, it costs too much money. So they'll have these infected devices inside the network and these infected devices can do things. I've seen E-Node-Bs infected. Um, I think one report one time or an interview I'll do is I'll interview uh, my colleagues in the United Kingdom who work for the NCSC in the United Kingdom who are part of the Huawei um, security community, like doing it because all the Huawei had to be tested before, you know, um, you know the, you know, institutions started pointing out that the code really is um, horrible. And, but the UK was pointing out early on, the code is really horrible. You can break into this really easily. Just plug into the ethernet and you're into the 4G network, right? That's the sort of like risk that you have with network devices if they're not secured properly and not thought about how to take care of it. You can't wait until the app, you can't tag on security into a, a network system. It has to be built into it, right? So this is kind of like the area of it. So then they go in there and they, they, this report is interesting. Then they continue. Then they start saying, here is how they did it. 
<laughs> Stage one, they did reconnaissance. What were they looking for? They were scanning for TCP, Telnet, right? And port 80, right? Looking for like configurations, right? And simple network management protocol, right? And then they were specifically looking for because there was a vulnerability with Cisco smart install. Okay, so there was a, you know, a Cisco fix to this now, right? I was looking at the SMI scanning data the shadow server had with it and it's like really small now. So it was a big threat and then it went down because they kind of plugged it up. But these others haven't been plugged up, right? So they, that was their reconnaissance stage. So this is essentially what shadow server can do for you, what the reconnaissance stage is. But then once you get in there, the weaponization and delivery, this is where they go through and they do different tricks. Like for instance, you know, why would people, you know, off of any of your network infrastructure allow, you know, trivial file transfer protocol to work these days? Just shut it off, shut down that port, just alarm on it if you see any of that traffic. But yet, this was one of the vectors they were using to actually do, um, you know, get get uh, into the these systems, right, and delivering their uh, configurations and control with it, right? Then they started exploiting it. And again, you know, they're doing brute force attacks to obtain Telnet and SSH logging credentials. Why? Because what happens on network devices, nobody looks at how many times somebody is doing a brute force breaking. Nobody's looking at the router. Nobody's looking at the password failures on the router. Nobody's turning on the login on the router to look at password failures. So you could go to a router and you go ding, 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 and hit it, hit it, hit it, and just let a script run until you've gone through and you know, got into with what is usually weak passwords because you don't have complicated password checkers on network devices, right? So, so you know, this is, um, you know, how they exploited, through, in, you know, they move laterally throughout the network. Then they installed their tool sets, right? All right, and then they set up the command and control and started doing their things. At this stage, the cyber actor is not restricted. They have, they're inside your network. And based off of this report from 2018, they could be inside your network today in the middle of a global crisis. Not a fun thing to find out. Yet this report was sitting right there. And the reason why I looked at it is because I'll point to the other report because it's not ended. What I was originally gonna do first was this one, because here last week, the US National Security Agency put out a special report, right? And this is the key to catch it, right in the first paragraph. Uh, Jai, you know, who wrote up an article, wrote up an article on this for Dark Reading. He 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 goes, I don't know why they did this. This is what's right there. In the, three years ago, Department of Homeland Def uh, Homeland Security released an alert on how cyber adversaries are obtaining hashed password values and other sensitive information from network infrastructure configura configuration files. That means what they found, and they got to go back to get, look at that report, is they found that the Russian state actors were actually getting the hash files of the passwords through broken in devices. So in other words, they were probably coming in with a ransomware and then finding the hash files stored on people's PCs and putting them into a repository and then using that to actually reverse and get into the routers, All right? Once the hashes were obtained, the adversaries were able to compromise the network devices because there's a bunch of the early hashes in Cisco that they have reversing tools. So a hash is encrypt a hash is not crypto, right? So so you know you do the old style of it. You can reverse the hash, right? If you get a hold of the hash, and that alert showed that the result of what happens when cyber adversaries can compromise the device. So this this came out last week, right in this particular crisis, <laughs> pointing out specifically Cisco. So if you got Cisco on your network, you probably want to call Cisco and say, let's go through an audit, let's go through and check everything. And then this guide, which I put the pointer to down there, goes through and, and walks through, here's how you do this. Now, a group like the US National Security Agency just doesn't put a report out this like this out for like fun. This is not fun for them. They're doing it because something's going on on our networks, right? So this is things we have to go through and check with. So it's not ended. So, if you had to do something right away and you, we look at the spoofer data, right? Then, you know, there's, this is what we call the point protection in the network. This is kind of like the module of this. Remember we talked about the different uh, toolkit 
in how we actually build resiliency into the network. So point protection is one of those areas in there, all right? So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna walk you through a, a technique that was developed in the 90s of how to start locking down your network. And then we'll jump around with different questions on, on, on the element with it, right? So, um, so here we go through um, a simple technique. So the simple technique, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take my network, which I don't have infrastructure access lists, I'm gonna start adding them into my network. And I'm gonna lock it down where outsiders have a more difficult time to mess with my network devices, right? So, so key thing I need to make this work is I gotta have a list of all my CIDR blocks and hopefully all my CIDR blocks that are network and systems and staff, right? So you go to your address plan and that's where you start. You go to the address plan and say, here's all my CIDR blocks allocated to me. And here's which ones I use for my network, for my VPN, for my systems, for my staff. So you break it down. So I can create a little CIDR access list. So I have that as my reference, right? And then with that, I'm gonna kind of follow through some of these steps here, right? There, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through to all my network devices, I'm gonna craft an ACL. And the access list is basically really simple. The only thing that can connect to my device, whether it's um, Telnet, SSH, uh, SNMP, the only thing that can connect to my devices are within my big CIDR block. So you don't limit it down, you do the entire CIDR block. Every, you know, slash, you know, 20, slash 22, slash 24, slash 17, whatever CIDR blocks you have. Every CIDR block, V4, V6, you put that in here and says, the source address has to be, so permit, it's basically an explicit permit, and then deny everything else. So it's really simple. Permit, source addresses for my CIDR block, deny everything else. Right there, you've just added a lot of resilience to your network devices, because now somebody has to pretend to be that spoofed address, right? They have to spoof your infrastructure. So you add, yeah, it, it's, it, you still can do mess around with it, but you just need it harder, right? And that's the key thing is to make it harder, right? So that's phase one, you get that done, right? That's every network device. Next one, phase two. Now you do an infrastructure access list. Now infrastructure access list is on the edge of your network, right? And edge of your network is both sides. Like if you're an internet service provider, this is on your parent side, this is on your exchange point side, this is on your customer side, right? The side facing the internet and the side facing your customers, that's outside. A lot of times you think your customers are inside. No, your customers are not inside. The customer is a different network, a different organization. You have to treat them as a hostile entity, right? They can be the source of miscreant activity. So you have to put your infrastructure access list on the edge, right? And this is an ACL. And some people would say, oh, but my network equipment can't handle the packet per second load. Well, then you really need to look at it because most most of the, of the modern equipment today, you can have simple access list to filter at line rate. And if something's not happening with that, call your vendor up and say, why can't I do this? This is really simple, basic 101 of security. And it's, a, it's, it's in one of the RFCs as a best practice to put these infrastructure access list in there. And in this infrastructure access list, what I'm gonna do is the, is, is the first thing I'm gonna do is an anti-spoofing. Anybody with my CIDR block, my big CIDR block, I'm gonna drop anything, so it's be a deny. Deny anything coming from the outside that equals my source address from the internet side, right? And then on the customer side, you do an explicit permit. You do like explicit permit where it basically says, you only can send what you actually allocated if you allocate an address to them, right? So on the internet side, you would do you know, anti-spoof. And here's my infrastructure, right? So that anti-spoof is going to actually um, fix you up here, right? Because once you got that explicit permit on, on you know, what can come in, right, um, on both sides of it, um, you've just uh, limited your risk from like somebody spoofing, like again, Russian state actors coming into your network with it. The risk to this is, you know, 
huge networks in the past over the last 25 so years doing this sort of approach we've just done it live on a network because it, it's it's like you're, you're not trying to do complicated access list you're just doing very simple access list and you deploy it watch it everything's okay pack it for seconds working okay go to the next device go to the next device right it's it kind of like plays out quite well right you go to the next phase now you start limiting. So then over time, and over time could be weeks. Over time, you know, you, you deploy a phase and you take a deep breath, monitor, everything working okay. Then you crank crank down the, the parameters and say, okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie it down where only certain devices inside my network can actually ask, access my network, my routers, my switches, and things like that, right? And then I tune it down even more. All right, and then audit it over the years because what happens is you configure it now, right? 2022, uh, you come back February 2023, things have changed. And things have changed because I think people, anybody who touches network gear knows, oh, I needed to put this bypass in. Oh, I needed to do this config or where I was configuring and troubleshooting something, I added this in. And you put these holes in, holes start coming into it, right? And you forget to remove them because you're so busy, you're moving from one problem, next problem. And then you go back a year later, you find, oh, you got all these holes. You got to clean it up. So just expect every year to kind of go through and just kind of polish it up and reset it and put it back in place, right? And that's kind of like the history of these, this sort of approach, this sort of technique. So, you know, then you use something like the shadow server report to audit because if you do it like this, shadow servers report for open SSH and open telnet won't work anymore. It will hit these filters and you can use it to audit. So this is one of the primary uses that uh, my company Akamai uses the shadow server daily reports. So one of the key, because we have, we have infrastructure all over the freaking planet. We have address space like crazy and we are very tight on making sure that, you know, this server has to be compliant in this way, right? And we know which shadow server reports to look at because the shadow server will go through and scan all our infrastructure all over the freaking planet. And so we get the reports, we process it. And if we find a particular server or a region that all of a sudden pops up on the shadow server report, we flag it, we remove the region, we take the region out of service, we open up a ticket, Engineers go in there and figure out, okay, what happened? Why is the configuration messed up? You know, it happens. I mean, when you got hundreds of thousands of servers deployed, these things happen. It's just, you know, statistical probability is things will happen. So what you have to do is you put in a check. And so this is the check that we put in, right? So we have the shadow server report and we have tools that we wrote ourselves, you know, that we use. So we use a combination of tools we wrote and the shadow server report. You guys can do the same thing. I mean, if it works for a company like us, it works like some of the big carriers in the United States, they do the same thing with it. It can work for you because this is how they lock, lock down with it. So, so that's a, a key thing of how to use this as, as an operational tool to save you a lot of money. You don't have, there are companies who will try to sell you a service like this. You don't need to pay for it. Just use Shadow Server, right? So let's pause for questions. What sort of questions are we, we can have here? come out of screen share for a minute and see if there's any questions. Oh, I ten found an article. <laughs> That's an old one. That's the one that got everybody mad. <laughs> Let's see if I pop it up. Uh, I can't cut and paste out of there. Yeah. CP38 R. So the Etienne was sharing this one in the chat. So people kind of get the, the context around it. Let me go ahead and share it real quick with the screen. Right there. There we go. So um so this is the one I kind of mentioned with when we were doing the source address validation work, 
is that uh, we were wrapping up with this with the first wave of the MIT spoofer project. That's a, the one pointed out here, the spoofer project here, right? And in there, we started, you know, I said, hey, we got the 80-20. The last 20% is going to be hard, right? It's because, you know, on here. And then what happened behind the scenes is there was an uproar. I mean, Paul Vixie was like yelling and screaming at me. No, we can't give up. We have to go after the 20%. I go, Paul, 20 is hard. The 20, what are we going to do, right? And everybody was arguing with me, which is kind of hard because, tools I helped instigate in the community that we use to do all these static filters, dynamic filters, forward to base filters, network address transitions, all these things we use to do the 80%. I was an instigator with it. But that 20% is hard. So this, this was a famous article because the consequence of that was, let's get new fund in. Uh, we've got the move. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kim Caffrey, she raised her hand says, we'll do it over here at CADA. Got over in CADA. And so now we got the tools that we got today. So, you know, you never know the power of a, of, a, of a key blog within the community or a key uh, email or something like that. So, you know, one of the things you can do to speak up in the community is to speak up in the community. So, um, okay. So since if, if we don't have any more questions, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a quick review of this module because you guys have the slides and I'm going to go through a couple of the quick concepts. Um, because we don't have time to cover everything in this. This is kind of like a whole day-long day session when we cover it in detail. So one of the things in here um, that, the, that you'll see come up over again is that when you go after routers, it's not just going after the edge, it's also going on after what's inside. You got to understand inside the device itself that you can actually overload the device. The device itself, a network router, a network switch, understanding the underlying architecture is critical. If you're buying a, a router or a switch, you should be having the vendor come in and explaining you the internal guts of how each line card and each you know, chassis works with the route processor and things like that. So in this one, this is a really old one. This is an old GSR engine three line card example where you had ingress, uh, packet processing and an egress packet processing. So packets that came into the router, packets that left the router going out the particular interface. And you, what you could do is you can tap, you know, set up crafted packets to attack these elements. So this is where we came up with this particular model over the years, where you got these planes of, of how things flow through a network from a network security. You have the data plane that people focus on all the time, right? But then you have your control plane. Your control plane glues everything together because that's your routing protocols. You can attack routing protocols, right? And going through and saying, here's my IGP security mechanism. Like one of the things that people forget is you have to go through and say, here's my architecture to make sure my IGP is secure. And the way things are going, if we're leaving Telnet open, I can guarantee you then that's those same networks are, don't have a plan for their IGP security, whether it's OSPF or IS to IS, or I don't think pe many people are using EIGRP, but it's usually OSPF or IS to IS. All right, so that's the control plane. Got to keep that, you know, have a security plan to protect that. There are techniques to do that. There's a management plane. So the management plane is like simple network management protocol. It's your netconf, it's your APIs, because we've moved to an API world, right? So part of the updates to this module is going to be like, okay, here's what it looks like today when you've got NetComp and using NetComp APIs to configure your device. Because there's a lot of things you can do with that. So this, 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 uh, the last update with this happened before NetComp started rolling out on network devices. Then you have service planes, especially when you get into some of the service chaining and elements like that. And this links into the policy plane, which is all your AAA service management, who gets access to what, roles-based systems, orchestration, all right? So orchestration is a combination of your services, management, and policy plane when you do an orchestration system. So that's how you have to think through it. But when you take it into the, the device, right? You have packets thrown. This is kind of like a simplified architecture of it. So you have the, the network processor, ASIC FPGA, packets flown through there. That will have a support and chip, a support and CPU. 
loading microcode to it. And then that will then coordinate with the distributed architecture to the route processor for the chassis, right? So this is kind of like a basic outlay of where, how routers or switches are built out, right? So you have your data plane where the packets are flowing through easy. Control plane is your routing protocols, right? Connected up. And the routing protocols have to go through the su supporting CPU over to the route processor. It's processed on the route processor, not inside the line card, right? So you got to understand. So already in those paths, the, what we call the punt path and receive path, right? Those paths are not, you know, super gigabyte. <laughs> this could be a 10 gigabyte connection on the data plane, but the punt path would be a 10 megabyte connection. So let's say that again. <laughs> if the control, the data plane will be a hundred gigabyte and the punt path and the receive path is using a cheap little ethernet chip because it's cheap and keeps the cost of the cogs down of the, of the router and it'll be a hundred megabyte because it's cheap, right? Oh, it should work okay until somebody overloads it with a, a DOS attack, right? That sort of thing, you know, they force the punt path. The management plane is things like Telnet, SSH, SMP, FTP, things like that, all right? So, so that's the management plane aspect of it, all right? Then, you know, this, where we combined the, the management and control plane together it was what we call the receive path to the route processor, all right? Then you get certain things where the ASIC or FPGA or network processor, it's being asked to do a feature that's not in the microcode. It, the chip can't do it. Right, because there's only certain functions. You, you, the chip is designed to do certain things. And if you start adding a feature into it where it can't work, what happens is the vendor takes a shortcut and they punt it out to the CPU, have the CPU do it, and then they forward it back in. Now, remember, uh, 100 gig, 10 meg, <laughs> that CPU is a small CPU, probably four generations old. It's not like a modern CPU as the line card comes out. Right, that is you know scary when you have to do a feature punt, right? So then we also get is you get certain things that sample out, like a lot of sample NetFlow. What happens is you take a copy of the packet and you send it over to the CPU, and then you process it and send it off, right? And people wonder how can you can how come you cannot turn up the sample rate? You can't turn up the sample rate because the punt path and the ASIC can't support it, right? So, so, um, so that's the what you have a, a sampled feature off of it, right? Then you'll have uh, services that run through it. So the services are terminated in the ASIC. So these would be like FPGAs where you're actually terminating things on there. Um, usually on a network processor, you have terminated services into it, or you have a daughter card connected to it with services connected to it, right? So, and then sometimes services are on the route processor itself, right? So asking these questions about what is processed where, give me what they call the day in the life of the packet. That's what you would usually call it. So vendor, come in here. Let me do a day in the life of the packet to find out how this all works out, right? And you can find out how these things would do it with where they have service plates or whatever. So these are all sort of things that you kind of think through about protecting the router device. But you notice, you know, as, as you walk through here, understanding how the functions of the equipment works, we go back to the alerts. The alerts, you know, never got down to this level, right? This is, this is possible. This is something to actually dive in, but the problems that are being highlighted that we need to focus on from a security standpoint are much more simple. You know, let's not have people able to tell it into my router from offside night network or outside my knock, right? That's the, the, uh, the, the aspect of it, right? So, so that's kind of like an idea of what we call the, the planes of, of security part. So, and this, this all started, this was, we kind of knew about it, but you get, you know, um, there, this kind of like a, a colleague at AOL kind of pushed this in 2004 to instigate to get everybody going with it. So, and then your risk assessment here, I'll just put the, through this last slide and then we'll, then we'll uh, do, do our break, is that you got to look at the entire path from the person in the knock who's controlling the router 
to the person who's because lots of people working from remote, you know, where would the bad guys get into, right? You know, you know, there's there's a lot of elements into how you do the orchestration telemetry. So it's not just attack against the device itself, it's against the telemetry of the system, right? Where you send the data off to, where you send it to configs, how you're configuring the routers, how you're accessing it, how you're doing the logs, all those things are part of the entire system that you have to look at of setting up an architecture to protect it because they're vulnerable to DOS attacks. People can actually poke at them and break into them. In this case, our DOS threat is a miscreant who's gotten into the router and decided, oh, I'm going to, what's a nasty attack? If I control a BGP speaking router and I want to really mess with somebody, what I would do is I would set up a script and de-aggregate the internet from my from, from that network I broke into. So what do I mean by de-aggregating the internet? De-aggregating the internet means that um, I send out slash 24s all over, right? I, I just go out there and, and say, you know, here is, you know, huge chunks of the internet and advertise it out. Now, what happens? Uh, all of a sudden, all that traffic starts, I start those, those ag, you know, de-aggregated routes all start coming to me, <laughs> right? All that traffic starts coming to me, right? And then you cause all this instability because those routes, all of a sudden routes start flapping and things go, start going on and the network, the internet goes haywire, your network goes down and that's a DOS attack. That's a type of DOS attack that if you can break into the router, you can do an attack like that, right? And that's a, that's a nasty form of attack. That's not like throwing you know, DDoS reflectors at you. That's a form of DOS attack that people have to think about. So before the break, any questions, any concerns? Uh, you guys got access to the entire slide deck. You can look through it to give you ideas of how to um, uh, lock down your network. But basically, the first part I talked about is the key thing. You know, get infrastructure access lists up on the edge of your network. Uh, put anti-spoof on there. Take your VTY access list, you know, the, the, the whatever access list that you use to lock down the device itself and set those up so you got anti-spoof. And then you become more and more explicit. Right, so you just say only my knock can get access. Only my netconf device can get access. Only here's my SNMP management tools can that get access. So you get you become first broad, and then you get more specific. And then if you can start up logging on the router, so when you put the access list on the V2Y access list, the last line is deny all log, and then that gives you a way where you can take the logs, export them over. You can start seeing who's starting to mess with your network. You're always going to have scans on the network. So don't worry about like, oh my goodness, you know, people are scanning my network. You're always going to have scanning your network. Shadow server sat scans your network. So you have a baseline of scanning. What you look for is a spike. Those of you who are with me uh, earlier, I gave the story about CNN in 2000. That was a V2I access list, deny all log. Right, so they permit, 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 deny everybody, log it. And then they plugged it into like a really old tool, MRTG, and then they saw the spike. So they had scan, 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 level scan. So they had a baseline. So they knew how many scans they would get a day from different organizations, I'll sign a spike. And they say, oh, something's going on. What's going on? Press the alert button. Let's get everybody ready to go, All right? And that's, this, that's it's, it's a simple sort of a tool, but powerful and has worked with many, many different organizations to help alert them. Okay, so I'm gonna stop our recording so we can take our break.